All right, food production in a scale that guarantees food security is a major challenge for many African countries. But potential in gene editing to improve crop yield is an area experts in the continents are seriously considering. Now, in this edition of the program, we will advance conversations on this front. And I am Charles Alpha, welcoming you to Africa Weekly. <music> Now, we begin with a collaborative effort where Nigeria's biosafety system is seen by some African countries as an all-encompassing tool in tackling risk associated with use of biotechnology in the production of genetically modified organisms. Now, to this end, Burkina Faso is the latest African country understudying Nigeria in this regard. African countries in search of a safe and effective bio system see the Nigerian experience as a source of inspiration and its system a veritable tool in guaranteeing a safer environment. From its standard template on mode of bio safety operations to regulating the presence of genetically modified organisms either in imported or exported products, Nigeria's bio safety management agency is not compromising standard in ensuring research institutes confirm with internationally acceptable standards through active communication and legal framework. These have attracted delegation from Burkina Faso, and they are in Nigeria to understudy this system. We are concerned about the human health, the animal health, plant life, and also the environment. So we are doing it right, that's why they are coming, and we will continue to do it right. For the Burkina Faso team, a lot of components necessary for operations are lacking in their country. And the team sees Nigeria's case as an eye-opener. We have learned that if you need to utilize biotechnology, you need to have a strong biosafety system with all the components. So Nigeria is doing very well. They are at the verge of... Um validating their national communication strategy on genome medicine and we are here to also put them through. This study is hoped will further boost the already existing bilateral cooperation between Nigeria and Burkina Faso. <music> Similarly, Nigeria is adopting measures in monitoring the activities of scientists in the areas of genetic engineering in crops and processing. So the African Union, under its development agency, is helping to produce guidelines for genome editing as experts assembled in Abuja, Nigeria, to advance training in this technology. Here gathered are scientists in the field of genetic engineering alongside farmers and media practitioners analyzing drafted documents on genome editing in Nigeria. The document was drafted with the support of the African Union Development Agency, Audane Pad. It is a communication strategy on the importance and impact of genome editing on food security. Director General of the National Biotechnology Development Agency and that of Biosafety Management Agency speak on the importance of the technology and government guidelines. This genome editing is a new technology that has come across the nation, across the continent of Africa, which if harnessed, it is going to transform the, uh, the, the, the development in terms of science, technology and innovation across the continent. So we partner with Alden Apart. Our officers are around the boundaries and always at the seaports, the land areas, to make sure that whenever any product comes in from those GM producing countries, we take the samples, take it to the lab, analyze, and see if it is authentic. The bacteria to go in and affect the plant. Nigeria is among African countries which adopted genetic engineering 
in food production, thus increasing yields and also reduce overdependence on the use of chemicals and insecticides to control pests and diseases. Okay, joining us now via Zoom is Professor Olaliko Akimbo of Alda Nepal, leading figure in technology in Africa. Prof, who want to say thank you very much for finding time to talk to us on Africa Weekly. Thank you so much for inviting us. Okay, now to begin with, Prof, let's take a look at where Africa is at the moment in terms of application of genome editing for crop production. Thank you for the question. At the moment, when you're talking of biotechnology, Africa is making this move and they are also adapting other marketing technology that could be of help to improve agricultural productivity. And, uh, many countries that have the capacity to develop a crop that is ready for farmers, they are just doing the feed testing that after the feed testing, they could get on with it. For the larger part of the continent, it's only a few countries that have really made advancements that the product is available, that is close to its availability to farmers. Mm. Okay, now, so a few days ago, there was a workshop in Nigeria on genome editing guidelines. So can you help us, take us through what the issues were? Thank you so much. Uh, as you will be reminded, the meeting of this is, uh, genome editing strategy that has been developed is not, is not just starting this week. It is a follow-up of the initial development that was initiated in December last year. And uh, I also bring to your, uh, uh, to your notes that it's not only in Nigeria that this strategy has been developed. There are other key countries in Africa that have already gone through this process. The country like Burkina Faso, Ghana, Ethiopia, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Malawi, Mozambique. Representation from all the region of Africa. And uh, what we were able to achieve in this uh, strategy do document that we started on Monday is to do validation. Validation in the sense that the key stakeholder that developed the guideline, the technical group that developed the guideline in December, there are few. Now we make effort for larger key stakeholder that is of interest to genome editing in the production of agriculture in Nigeria to have their say, to have full representation, and to also look at the document that was earlier developed so that if there's any gaps that the constituency or the stakeholder that are in this meeting on Monday or on Tuesday, if there's any gap they identified that was not capture, which is not reflecting the interest of their constituency, they can bring it on board. And through this, we have an holistic uh, communication strategy that can speak to both the policymaker, that will speak to both the non-government organization, the civil society, the agricultural sector, the industry, the finance, every stakeholder that is of interest to the development of agriculture and using innovation. So these are the key reasons why the stakeholder uh, validation is, is critical and the larger number of stakeholders participated. Okay, now, Prof, I'd like to say now, are the rates in you know, Nigeria is going, would you say uh, it has the capacity to adopt this technology safely? Absolutely. I can say with emphasis, absolutely. Nigeria is a giant in Africa in everything. Nigeria has created an enabling environment for the uh, use of emerging technology. Nigeria is diversifying its economy from all sector to agricultural base, knowing fully that 
Afri uh, Nigeria is an agri-based agri 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 uh, continent before we put oil in our uh, oil sector. Now, speaking of the capacity, all the research institutes in Nigeria that are their mandate is to improve on agriculture. Most of them, they have the research component that improve use in the, in the use of our technology. I will just mention two, three or four, uh, just for uh, us to quickly know. Zaria is one of the research institutes that are very advanced because they have used technology to improve on the production of cowpea. Omudike is another uh, research institute that are also working heavily on biotechnology, especially in transformation. Badegi is another one that's working on rice that they're also using the biotechnology. Mm -hmm. NR uh, Nihot is another research institute in the West that are also working on biotechnology. I picked from each zone of Nigeria to be able to see that the capacity is there, the facility is there, the only thing that is remaining is for them to be in the mainstream of the activity. So at the end of the day, they will build on the facility that is available to deploy and to use it to improve agriculture seed that okay. will be developing through research. All right, so now in the next five... Maybe as you had to this before we leave, can I just add one more point Quickly. to this before I leave that Quickly, stage? Quickly, please. Also, the enabling environment that is required for this technology to be deployed in Nigeria, the government of Nigeria have created that enabling environment with the creation of National Power Safety Management Agency, where this agency has also developed a guideline on the regulation of this emerging technology, genome editing. And their guidelines are specified that it's not a business as usual mm -hmm. if there is foreign genetic material in any genetic edit edited product is to be regulated. If there's no foreign genetic material in the genetic edited product, it should not be regulated. This shows a clear pathway in which Nigeria is already positioned itself for the technology to be in harness. Okay, Thank so, you. okay, now, so, Prof, uh, before and I'll let you go finally. Now, in the next five years, I was going to ask you that where would you see the application of these technology across the continents in, say, agriculture? In the next five years, I can tell you if the progression we are seeing, the political buy-in we are seeing, and the positivity that is coming from the policymaker, if that tempo is... Is, is, is sustained and we drive through the agenda 2063, the mandate that the African Union has given to African Union Development Agency is abided by. I can tell you, yes. And the first product that we can, let's say the two products that we can get in the next few years, maybe the next three or four years, the first one is maize. These have been developed in, 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 in Kenya and is going through feed trial. And those that are at Grodomi, they understand that for you to release a variety, it goes through free trial to take the genetic by environment influence to change the DOC. Right. Now, another crop that we know is not actually the of the national interest is TEF, T E F. Right. They use it to produce injara in, uh, in, in, in Ethiopia. So, those two products they are really at the advance. And in the next couple of months, a, a year, maybe next two, three years, we should be able to get it to farmer. All right. Thank you, Prof Akimbo, for your thought today on this topic. Thank you very much for finding time to talk to us on Africa Weekly. Thank you so much for the privilege. I'm so grateful that after Nigeria is making progress and NTA is a good voice. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you very much. To have a great day. All right. So. The 63rd ordinary session of ECOWAS heads of state and government recently ended in Guinea-Bissau with the leaders resolving to strengthen bilateral ties and defend the regional integrity of the sub-region against any form of terrorism. At the end of the summit, Nigeria's President Bola Ahmed Tinubu 
was elected as the chairman of the sub-regional organization. In his acceptance speech, President Tinibu promised to take democracy seriously, noting that democracy, though tough, is the best form of government. President Tinibu, who is the latest entrant into the exclusive club of heads of state in West Africa, accepted the honor on behalf of Nigeria with a solemn pledge to bear the responsibility of the office and run an inclusive administration of the regional organization. We will work collectively to pursue inclusive economic integration of West Africa. We should serve a warning to exploiters that our people have suffered enough. The new ECOWAS chairman noted that ECOWAS had developed a security architecture which covers a wide range of areas that involved kinetic and non-kinetic operations, including preventive diplomacy. Noting also the regional plan of action on fight against terrorism, as well as the operationalization of the ECOWAS standby force on fight against terrorism. The Nigerian leader, however, warned that the threats to peace in the sub-region had reached an alarming proportion with terrorism and the emerging pattern of military takeover that now demand urgent and concerted actions. We will not allow coup after coup West Africa subregion. We will take this up seriously. We must bite back. We can't sit like toothless bulldog and everyone. On his emergence as chairman on his first participation at the summit, having just started out as the elected leader of Nigeria, President Tinubu stated that he was humbled and honored by the trust to assume the leadership of the regional body, pledging his commitment to serve the interest of the community. We should make a pledge here that in furtherance of our region's economic recovery and growth, we will commit to democracy and promote democracy and rule of law. I am with you. In Nigeria, we are back. Tinibu succeeds President Umaru Ember of Guinea-Bissau as ECOWAS chair. The 63rd Ordinary Section Summit was the first engagement of the president within the continent since he assumed office on May 29, 2023. Now, issues of youth development to tackle restiveness and insecurity is an ongoing endeavor of the government of Nigeria. And how can this be effectively realized is what the Ventin Bako Executive Secretary, CEO, NYSC Foundation will share with us. <music> Joining me now live in the studio to talk more on this issue is the Executive Secretary and CEO NYC Foundation, Barista Ventim Bako. Barista, I want to say thank you very much for coming on Africa Weekly. Thank you for having me this afternoon. And viewers, good afternoon to you all. All right. Uh, how is uh, NYC in the meeting its mandate? As we are aware, the mandate of uh, NYC was primarily created to uh, foster national unity and integration. And uh, in addition to national unity and integration, is building the capacity of the Nigerian youth as a catalyst to development. Of course, uh, besides that, there are a number of things that NYC have been doing within its um, mandate. But within the context of um, the issues that we've just enumerated, 
I will gladly say um, NYIC has done a lot to provide those opportunities for the Nigerian youth. And within the contents of its programming, um, skills development, uh, orientation programs, and initiatives that NYC Foundation is all equally complementing with regards to the mandate of the NYC scheme. So generally speaking, um, NYC creates that opportunity for the Nigerian roots to express his or her uh, potentials in terms of the capability that are in doubt. And then we provide through the platform of the orientation leadership uh, training programs. Uh, we provide opportunities for those who have artistic um, qualities to showcase them through various social engagements and then through the discipline which is the military aspect of it creating uh, the opportunity for the Nigerian youth to, to be more disciplined to face the challenges out there because um, most of them coming out from the universities are built on theories but when you come to the NYC orientation program within the three months orientation program that illusion is broken down to reality of what you face outside there so the components and the contents of the orientation program prepares the nigerian youth to face the reality outside there in terms of uh, providing their potentials for uh, nationhood development okay so now if you look at uh, the nyc itself and then you now have uh, what you call the nyc foundation are these two separate entities and if they are uh, how do they carry out their activities? The NYC scheme and the NYC foundation are two separate entities, um, two legal separate bodies providing right. different mandates, however, complementing each other in terms of um, uh, the ultimate goals of facilitating and fostering national unity and integration, as well as providing opportunities for the Nigerian youth to be self-reliant and then create wealth for nation building. Um, perhaps let me just um, uh, emphasize a little bit about the NYC Foundation. The NYC Foundation historically was set up by the um, uh, ex-core members and then uh, with the management of the NYC scheme itself to provide, to serve as a stopgap and then a platform where they will galvanize all the core members together and those, those who are serving and those who have served to come back and provide support and initiatives to the younger ones coming up. So the foundation is an intervention platform that provides, complements the efforts of the NYSC scheme in terms of uh, providing facilities for the core members at the various orientation camps uh, providing training programs for them to complement the SAID training program that NYC does for them at the orientation camps. And then as well as after going through the training programs, we give them the opportunity to access our soft grants where financing is a challenge because after giving them the training, you have to provide a tool for them to uh, put the training and, and, their, and their ideas together. So we do that and we give them um, access to soft loans, um, which a number of them have access and have benefited from it. And right. it's a continuous program that we keep doing from time to time. So I thank you very much, Barista Ventim Bako, uh, the Executive Secretary and Chief Executive Officer at NYSC Foundation. Thank you very much for uh, coming on the program. Thank you, I'm most grateful. And right, uh, you. Nigerian youths, keep doing your best right. and remain focused. That's all right. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Yeah. And that's our package this week on Africa Weekly. Many thanks for being part of it. I am Charles Alva. Thanks for watching. <laughs>